Good morning, folks. Thank you for coming to our webinar by Karen Holcomb, uh, a jointly sponsored NOAA and CDC uh, presentation. Uh, my name is Stan Benjamin. I work for the NOAA Global Systems Laboratory. Uh, NOAA has uh, sought to uh, work with the uh, uh, CDC uh, folks to be able to uh, improve the uh, use of environmental data that NOAA does uh, with health uh, uh, applications. Karen Holcomb uh, uh, is serving as a postdoc, uh, a postdoc that is sponsored by the NOAA Climate Program Office. Uh, so Karen will start her presentation in just a minute, but I would like to first uh, introduce uh, some of our colleagues with our team working with Karen, uh, first with Hunter Jones from uh, Climate Program Office. Thank you, Stan. Hi, everyone. Good morning. This is Hunter Jones from the Climate Program Office. I'm the Climate and Health Project Manager there. Uh, with Julie Triton, the NOAA One Health and Integrated Climate Research Lead, um, the two of us developed uh, the idea for this and funded this postdoc opportunity with the NOAA, with NOAA DSL and CDC to strengthen collaboration between our agencies in the realm of climate services and vector-borne disease prediction. A collaboration made all the more important by the ongoing pandemic and an increased interest in pandemic prediction. So we're thrilled to have Karen with us and uh, for what we hope will be the first of many NOAA CDC postdocs. Thank you. We'd also like to introduce our colleague Ben Beard uh, from CDC, who also is part of this uh, work in the project with Karen and with NOAA. Go ahead, Ben. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Um, again, Ben Beard, I'm Deputy Director of CDC's Division of Vector-Borne Diseases. We're located in Fort Collins, Colorado. We've got a staff of about 450 employees, and we are broadly charged with the responsibility of uh, surveillance, uh, prevention and control, diagnostics, uh, outbreak response for uh, all uh, vector-borne diseases in the United States. And so we are, um, you know, one of the things we're really keen on doing and been working on for a number of years to no avail really is developing um, uh, forecasting tools that will help us better prepare for uh, outbreaks of vector-borne diseases. And um, as you might surmise, weather, weather patterns and climate um, has a huge impact on how these outbreaks occur because of the impact that it has on mosquitoes and on the animal reservoirs for the viruses that they carry. And so we were really excited to have the experts from NOAA uh, in this area reach out and um, offer their hand in helping us work through this, uh, what's been to date a fairly intractable problem. And uh, so we're e really eager about the public health benefits that we hope will come out of this and, uh, and the uh, work that uh, Karen's gonna be talking about today in this uh, particular area of uh, focus. Thanks, Dan and Hunter. Thanks, uh, Karen got her PhD this last spring from University of California at Davis in epidemiology. She did her undergrad work at Colorado State University. Karen, thank you for giving this introductory talk. We turn it over to you. Yeah, thank you so much, Stan and Hunter and uh, Ben for those introductions. And I'm excited to be with you today to weave some of the pieces together from my dissertation as well as my postdoc and give you, you all an uh, overview of the impacts of vector control and weather on mosquito populations and West Nile virus transmission. And some of the themes that are going to be woven throughout this presentation are providing a background on West Nile virus, the mosquitoes that carry West Nile, as well as current mosquito control practices, also called vector control. And I'll also be pulling in a lot of my dissertation research, which looked at the impacts of vector control on West Nile virus transmission, focusing on aerial spraying and ivermectin. And then I'm also going to be weaving in the impacts of weather on West Nile virus transmission, mosquitoes, and the prediction of West Nile virus, which as you heard is going to form the core of my postdoc. So West Nile virus is the leading cause of mosquito-borne disease in the United States. It's maintained between mosquitoes and then birds, which act as amplifier and reservoir hosts. Infectious mosquitoes can also bite horses and humans, which are called dead end hosts, meaning they do not get enough virus in their bloodstreams in order for mosquitoes that bite them to become infected. 
when humans become infected, there are multiple different manifestations. About 80% of infections are actually asymptomatic. About 20% result in a febrile illness. And about 1% of all infections result in a severe form of the disease, a neuroinvasive form with encephalitis, meningitis, and acute flaccid paralysis. And for those who have the severe form of the disease, there's about a 10% case fatality rate. Since West Nile virus invaded the United States in 1999, there have been over 25,000 neuroinvasive cases and almost 2,400 deaths reported to the CDC. And the total number of infections is estimated to have exceeded 7 million. There's no human vaccine and there's no treatment specific to West Nile virus. So prevention of transmission primarily focuses on controlling the mosquito populations with vector control or by personal protective measures like wearing insecticidal sprays, long sleeves, trying to avoid when mosquitoes are flying at night time frames. There's a marked seasonality to West Nile virus cases in the United States, peaking overall between August and September when the mosquitoes are most active during this time. However, between years, it is very hard to estimate what and predict the number of cases that there will be. It's highly heterogeneous due to a variety of different factors. And also, when we look spatially, it's very heterogeneous on where these cases are actually occurring with the largest incidence along those Great Plains states and Central Valley of California, and then some down in Texas, Mississippi River Delta area. So in order to understand these, we need to understand, try to predict where these cases are occurring year to year, which is very hard. And another piece in the picture are the mosquitoes themselves that transmit West Nile virus. The predominant ones are Culex mosquitoes, Culex pipiens, and Culex fasciatus, which are in what we call the Culex pipiens complex. And there's also Culex tarsalis. The ranges overlap for a large proportion of these. However, when we look at the mosquitoes themselves, their life cycle is exactly the same, where adults emerge from uh, pupa in water and females, once they take a blood meal, lay eggs, which then hatch into larva, pupa, and then the cycle continues. For Gilex pipians mosquitoes, however, that breeding site occurs predominantly in containers, pots or dishes that can get left out in backyards, as well as uh, storm sewers and storm drains. In contrast, for Culex tarsalis, they primarily, primarily breed in more agricultural areas like rice fields, and they have also been found recently to start uh, exploiting neglected swimming pools and backyards. So as we start to disentangle the multiple factors and directions of the relationships influencing West Nile virus transmission and mosquito populations, I'm gonna walk you through this little diagram to start identifying major factors in the direction of their relationship. So overall, having Infectious mosquitoes is positively associated with having human cases. Previous human infection develops human immunity, which reduces those cases. On the mosquito side, birds that have recovered from West Nile virus become immune, and therefore mosquitoes cannot reinfect those birds and cannot pick up West Nile, so that reduces infection prevalence. When we move on to some of the more weather factors, we're gonna start with looking at temperature. Increased temperature increases the developmental rate for mosquitoes. So that cycle from adult egg continues faster. However, at increasing temperatures, there's also increased mortality to the different life stages. So it's a balancing act with increased temperature. Temperature also impacts uh, the virus itself. We're having increased temperature shortens what we call the extrinsic incubation period, which is the time from when a mosquito is infected to when it becomes infectious and able to transmit. This period gets shorter with increased temperature. And mosquitoes also bite more often at higher temperatures. For precipitation, this also has a balancing effect where increased precipitation like rain can actually clean out some of those larval breeding sites and remove the larva, reducing abundance. But it can also create new breeding sites for mosquitoes to be able to breed in on the short term and also long term, thinking about snowpack, 
having high amounts of snowpack in the mountains results in large amounts of water that it will be available in spring to melt and run down and create mosquito breeding habitats as well. In the winter, freezes also have an impact on mosquito abundance by killing overwintering mosquitoes if it gets too cold and they're not able to hide in different places to protect themselves. When we come to look at drought, also another balancing impact where drought reduces the number of predators there are for those juvenile stages of the mosquitoes. So the mosquitoes are freer to develop, but it also removes breeding sites by drying them up. And with those drying up of patches, birds and mosquitoes aggregate together at some of those water sources that are still around in those locations. And therefore we have our birds and our mosquitoes in the same place to be able to transmit West Nile virus more efficiently back and forth. So this can result in increased infection prevalence in our mosquitoes. And then another major piece is vector control, which aims to reduce the number of infectious mosquitoes there are, therefore prevent human cases. It primarily does this by reducing mosquito abundance. And it's throughout the mosquito's life cycle that we're able to enact the vector control. First on the larval side for the eggs, we can remove breeding sites by removing water that's in standing locations, eliminating standing water in other locations, making sure storm drains flow well and the like. And also applying larvicides to water to kill those uh, juvenile stages. And then when larval control is not possible or cost effective, the more immediate control measures are needed, adulticides can be utilized to kill those adult mosquitoes, either backpack spraying, truck mounted, or aerial spraying as well. And of those insecticides, there's two main broad classes that both result in paralysis and death of the mosquito through two different mechanisms. The pyrethrin and pyrethroids inactivate the sodium voltage, calcium, the sodium voltage channel on the mosquito neuron, preventing nerve activation. Organophosphates, on the other hand, inactivate the acetylcholinesterase enzyme that's in the synapse and prevents degradation of the signaling, therefore resulting in uncontrolled nerve activation. And these two pieces are going to become useful in further stages as we move along. So now moving into inve more investigations of exactly how does vector control impact mosquito populations in West Nile virus. This was the theme of my dissertation. And I looked at aerial spraying, the conventional approach, and then moved into a novel use of ivermectin as West Nile virus control strategy. And before we get any further into this, I want to thank the huge number of people who were invested and helped in all of the different stages of my dissertation. It was a large collaborative effort spanning multiple states and agencies and locations. So thank you all so very much, especially my PI, Dr. Chris Parker. So Part one of the dissertation focused on aerial applications of insecticides and wanted to understand what is the expected change in abundance of those mosquitoes and how does this vary across space utilizing a modeling approach. In aerial insecticides are utilized during periods of high risk. So this means there's large numbers of infectious mosquitoes in proximity to humans. So high risk for transmission of West Nile to humans. And for aerial spraying to be enacted, there needs to be optimal meteorological conditions of a temperature inversion and light wind to keep the sprayed insecticide at the correct height to impact the majority of the mosquitoes that are flying and not have it drift too far or immediately drop down to the ground. And when we are trying to understand, well, what is the risk in mosquitoes? This is done through mosquito surveillance. Two of the common ways are CO2 baited traps and graphite traps. Both use different kinds of attractants to collect different kinds of mosquitoes. So for the CO2 baited trap, this utilizes a cooler of dry ice that releases CO2 as the dry ice sublimates. This attracts the mosquitoes that are looking for a host. They use CO2 to find locations and animals so they can take bites and get their blood. And then the mosquito comes, gets sucked in through the fan into the collection bag. 
for the gravid mosquito trap, this utilizes hay infused water where a mosquito will land looking to lay its eggs in this water and then get sucked up again into the collection bag. And mosquitoes from both of these collection bags can be collected and you can speciate uh, mosquitoes, what sex they are, how many are there. And it's very important to differentiate males and females because females are the only mosquitoes that actually bite and therefore are involved in uh, disease transmission. And by testing those mosquitoes, we can determine do they have prevalent uh, do they have evidence of West Nile virus in them or other diseases as well? And utilizing trapping over many years to allow comparisons of trends, what is the normal abundance as well as therefore deviating if this is a high risk period or a lower risk period. And for uh, evaluating how well mosquito control strategies work, it also employs um, mosquito surveillance techniques one of the predominant ways to estimate the impact of aerial spraying is what's called Mola's formula. It uses the change in mosquito traps inside our spray zone before our spraying to after our spraying as compared to that same comparison of a treatment of a mosquito trap in an adjacent unsprayed location before and after. And it assumes that all four of these traps are independent measures of what the abundance of mosquitoes is. The change in from pre to post is only due to treatment and the population dynamics would have been same in the treatment area as we had seen in the control. So if no spraying had happened in our treatment zone, it would have looked identical to what happened in our control zone. However, these assumptions are often violated in the field and it's hard to be able to establish an ideal control that is not impacted by other factors that are unrelated to aerial spraying. When we look at estimates for the impact of aerial spraying, we see a wide range from 100% reduction, meaning complete elimination of the local population, to zero, meaning no impact, and paradoxically positive, meaning that we're increasing mosquitoes by spraying insecticides which is biologically impossible. So we need to account for those spatiotemporal dynamics of mosquitoes that are moving around and be able to identify well, what would have been the effect if aerial spraying had never occurred. So I set this study in Sacramento and Yolo counties in Northern California. The land use is divided into three predominant areas, crops, irrigated agricultural like rice, or urban areas and our surrounding natural areas. During the West Nile virus transmission season of summer, there's very minimal precipitation and per temperature ranges between 15 to 35 degrees Celsius. I was able to work with the Mosquito and Vector Control District that covers these two counties and obtained 12 years of their data, 2006 to 2017. I obtained over 24,000 CO2 beta trapping events for Culex Tars Alice and Culex Pipians. I also had 930 aerial spray events that had happened during this time. Each is represented by that coral polygon in the plot. And a variety of different product classes and products themselves were utilized, both organophosphates and pyrethrums, pyrethroids. So the first order of business was to connect those aerial spray events to those collection events to be able to identify what was the dose of aerial spraying that a, that a mosquito population was receiving. So I did this in a twofold approach. First, spatially, I created what I called collection areas around each of those mosquito traps, meaning uh, as a circle that represents the area that a trap collects mosquitoes from, used a flight distance conservative flight distance for the mosquitoes and then overlapped that with the aerial spray polygons to determine what proportion of those collection areas received um, aerial spraying, as well as what was the temporal sequence of aerial spraying prior to when a mosquito trap was set out. So this little cartoon indicates that this trap was set in an area that had been sprayed three and four weeks ago. I also tracked what was the broad product class that was being utilized since there were a variety of different products that had been used. So in addition to these variables that quantify the impact or the spatiotemporal impact of aerial spraying, I also included 
other variables that are known to impact mosquito abundance. Seasonality, as well as the location within the area. And then combined this, therefore, with what was that land use habitat area where that trap was set? Was it an urban, agricultural, or natural area to capture those breeding sites for the mosquitoes? And to, impact, to capture the impact of weather, I looked at temperature because there's really no precipitation during the summer here in this area. So I used a two week average temperature to capture developmental rates, as well as a deviation from average temperature to capture different activity rates. So if it's warmer than normal, mosquitoes are more active, and if it's cooler than normal, they're less active. And I downloaded this from the PRISM data set. So utilizing those variables that are in that gold box, I use them to establish what would have been the expected abundance of these mosquitoes if aerial spraying had never occurred. I first set a spatiotemporal variation. So broadly across the two uh, counties in the 12 years, what are the broad trends in abundance, as well as what is the interannual variation within each year reflective of the different habitat types and the, therefore the different breeding sites that are around, as well as the impact of temperature on these mosquito populations. So by establishing what we would expect our mosquito population to be, we can identify deviations from this due to the spatiotemporal impacts of aerial adulticides and identify was there a difference if different product classes had been utilized. And for Aculex pipians, there was. So if we hop into start looking at the expected change for Culex pipians if all sprays during the previous four, year, four weeks have been pyrethroids or pyrethroids. So this plot and subsequent ones, the x-axis is our spatial impact. So this is the average proportion of that five kilometer collection area around each collection event that was sprayed with 100% meaning 100% spatial coverage. And then our y-axis is that temporal sequence where I've ordered the sprays with fewest and those furthest back in time at the bottom. So we start with just spraying four weeks ago and then working up to the middle that's spraying just one week ago and continuing up from there, we add more sprays. So the top is spraying every single week for the previous four weeks. And broadly, as you look at this plot, you'll notice it has a very jagged appearance. That's because there was a large number of those spatiotemporal combinations that were not observed in the data. So I was unable to estimate what would we have expected that change to have been. And broadly, as we move from left to right, as we increase spatial coverage, there's a general reduction. It gets bluer, meaning there's a larger reductions in the middle of a spray event versus on the fringe, which makes sense. And also when we move from bottom to top, as we get closer in time, there's more reduction. So aerial sprays have more impact closer they are than those further back in time. But if we look back at the bottom of the plot, you'll notice that it's kind of red, meaning we're estimating a potential increase in mosquitoes, highlighting a potential rebound effect of our mosquito populations with aerial spraying. But this does not negate our immediate public health benefit and goal of aerial spraying by rapidly reducing populations. So if we look at one week ago, 100% spatial coverage, we have a 52.4% reduction, meaning we're killing over half of the current mosquito population. And if at least one organophosphate had been utilized during those previous four weeks, we had even greater reductions, such that our 100% 100, 100 spatial coverage one week ago has a 76.2% reduction. When we shift to look more at Culex tarsalis, you'll notice that the trends are very similar but the magnitude of reduction is smaller such that our one week ago 100 spatial coverage only results in about a third of the mosquitoes being killed and we believe that this variation in effect is due to the habitat and dispersal of these different mosquito species Felix pepians is predominantly an urban mosquito and forms very focal populations such that an aerial spray event would kill the majority of the adults that are currently surviving there. And for Culex tarsalis, 
This forms very large populations in the large amount of irrigated agricultural rice fields in our study area, such that an aerial spray event would only impact a small proportion of those mosquitoes. And there's rapid immigration of mosquitoes from surrounding areas into that, into that sprayed zone. So concluding this portion, aerial sprays do reduce the abundance of West Nile factors in the following weeks. And the variation and effect can be related to their habitat use and dispersal of these different species. There is evidence for a population rebound for both species two to four weeks after spraying. And we, were, we would like to investigate in the future, does this actually impact infection prevalence? Because we expect those mosquitoes that are um, coming in and causing that population rebound are newly emerged and uninfected. So some of the limitations that limited the, the analysis were sparse trapping in our agricultural areas, especially the spray zones. We were unable to fully estimate the spatiotemporal impacts. However, we were able to use this long-term data set to isolate the effect of aerial spraying and establish what would be the expected abundance of mosquitoes to compare with what we see without having to have an independent control, which can be very hard to establish in the field. And also identify areas spatially and temporally that vector control can see and realize they might need some more trapping in there to be able to fully elucidate what are the impacts of aerial spraying and other kinds of vector control. So now as we move into part two, we're going to now here, focus I, on the I interrupt here briefly? Yes. Uh, so yeah, this is Stan. Uh, for all of you from NOAA here, uh, there's a few of us uh, that have been working with Karen over the last few months, and we've learned some of this. This is a dizzying set of information uh, for all of you. So we just wanted to stop here briefly. If there are any clarification questions that any of you want to briefly ask right now, we'll do more uh, answering of questions by Karen at the end. Do any of you want to bring up any question questions at this point right now? There is a uh, chat box there also. Uh, Evan, uh, Polina asks uh, this question. Karen, so I'll ask you this. Uh, are there environmental costs associated with aerial spraying? Yes, you are jumping the gun slightly. But okay. there, can be potentially, there can be potential non-target effects for um, insecticide applications when they impact other insects or can accumulate in the environment as well, which is one of the reasons we want to look at some novel vector control strategies. Karen, are there any uh, forecast information that are used already right now by aerial spraying companies? Do they acquire information from NOAA or other people? Is that already used at this point? Um, they're using information of weather conditions to be able to identify a, like a day in advance. Does it look like they can enact those aerial sprays? Does it look like there's going to be a temperature inversion and wind is, not go is going to be present but not too strong? I don't know exactly where they're getting it from. It might be National Weather Service. Okay, great. Uh, Karen, why don't you keep going? Uh, Thank you for the quick break there. Oh, you're welcome. So as uh, alluded to by that question, there's limitations to our current mosquito control strategies that prevent us from being able to control mosquitoes completely effectively. Like there's insecticide resistance developing in, those, in the mosquitoes, as well as non-target effects of those insecticides. And it's logistically difficult to enact these uh, sprays, especially aerial sprays, which require large amounts of investment of time and meteorological conditions. And there's low specificity in targeting the mosquitoes actually involved in West Nile virus transmission. So those mosquitoes that are actually biting the birds or can be infected can be very hard to target. However, ivermectin may provide an alternative. As we know, it's a widely used antiparasitic drug in human and veterinary medicine with low to no toxicity in mammals and birds. And it's recently been described to have mosquitocidal properties in blood. So after oral ingestion of ivermectin, your blood becomes toxic to mosquitoes. 
In this, uh, mosquito subtle properties utilize a different mode of action than current insecticides. So are not trying to enact the same pathways where mosquitoes are developing insecticide resistance. So when we look at ivermectin, I've broken it into two chapters. One was a pilot trial of ivermectin treated chickens to see, is this a viable West Nile virus control option? And then moving into the initial stages of wild bird delivered ivermectin, which would be hopefully the end result of this project. And I used a combination of field work and modeling to identify the potential um, applicability and range of effects that this could be effective under. So visually, what, we're propo what we proposed was to put ivermectin treated chickens in backyards, which would reduce West Nile virus transmission. And this would happen first on the individual chicken level, where a chicken that was treated, a mosquito would bite it and die within two to three days. Otherwise, it could have lived up to 14 days, so dramatic reduction in its lifespan. And from the, that flock, this scales up to having neighborhood level impacts where there's a zone of reduced lifespan for those mosquitoes and reduced number of mosquitoes that are infected with West Nile because they're dying before they have a chance to take another blood meal and pick up West Nile. Therefore, we're reducing the local West Nile virus transmission. So to study this in uh, nature, we did a pilot trial with backyard chickens with four treated and four untreated control flocks randomly assigned and located across Davis with ivermectin mixed into their food. And this was during the summer of 2019. Around each of the flocks, we monitored mosquito populations to identify what was the impact with three traps at a near distance and three at a far distance, capture abundance, infection prevalence, and age structure, which I will touch on again. In chicken serology, we took blood draws from our chickens biweekly to monitor for West Nile virus infection and blood concentrations. At the end of the study, there was evidence for lower West Nile virus transmission at our treated coops. There were fewer chickens that had been infected with West Nile or seroconverted, so fewer were seropositive at the end of our study, and these occurred later than those that happened in our untreated flocks. So to connect this change in transmission to ivermectin itself, we randomly selected one chicken from each coop and then fed wild mosquitoes on it overnight, collected those mosquitoes and watched them to see if they died over time. And while there was lower than expected and variable ivermectin serum concentrations in our chickens, we did see increased mortality in our wild mosquitoes that were biting treated versus untreated chickens. And then zooming in to look at, well, how is this mortality impacting the age structure of the population, if at all we did ovarian dissections. So dissected the ovaries out of mosquitoes, and then from there we're able to quantify if they're older or younger. Older meaning they've taken a blood meal and have laid at least one batch of eggs. And there was a reduction in those older mosquitoes, those that had taken at least one blood meal around our treated versus our untreated flocks, showing that it was those mosquitoes that we were killing likely. However, looking at abundance and infection prevalence, there was no significant difference between our treated and untreated groups, potentially due to immigration of mosquitoes from larval habitats. It was also a low West Nile virus year in our study area, and we had small sample sizes to detect a difference. Overall, our pilot trial showed us that there were no adverse health impacts of ivermectin on our treated chickens, highlighting that this seemed to be a safe method. There was also evidence for reduction in West Nile virus transmission with ivermectin administration. We had reduced serum conversions in our treated chickens, increased mortality in our wild mosquitoes that fed on treated chickens, and fewer older mosquitoes around our treated flocks, with similar entomological indices between them, highlighting that we did not fully elucidate the impact, but we need further investigation of this method and to be able to identify some of those highly influential parameters that were impacting transmission or our ability to see changes in mosquito populations. So the ultimate goal for ivermectin would be to have ivermectin treated bird feeders in neighborhoods. 
where common birds like those on the bottom of the slide would come and self-medicate. And some of the major pieces that need to be elucidated is how many of these birds would actually be visiting bird feeders and where are they going at night? So what proportion of birds in a neighborhood visit a bird feeder and would get self-medicated? And where do they sleep at night and how often do they change locations? Because it is at night when the mosquitoes bite our birds and would be exposed to ivermectin. And the goal is to be able to understand how many bird feeders would be needed for local control of West Nile and does their spatial arrangement matter? I did some field work in 2020 with untreated bird feeders in a neighborhood and had mon monitored them with motion activated cameras to monitor bird feeder usage and visitation and then tagged birds with radio telemetry tags to be able to locate them at night, where are they sleeping, as well as tags that uh, radio frequency identification tags that monitor or ping us when a bird comes to a feeder so we can monitor bird feeder usage and visitation. We also did point counts in the local area to determine what was the local composition of birds and what proportion of those then were we seeing coming to feeders in our area. And then we took all of this spatial data and bird movement and bird preference and inputted it into a mathematical model of West Nile virus with ivermectin treated birds, backyard bird feeders. And this is called a spatially implicit patch model where we take our neighborhood and divide it into two patches, our treated and untreated. Our treated patch represents those locations with treated feeders and our untreated patches are, the, are everything else. We let our birds and mosquitoes move back and forth across the neighborhood, which captures movement between our patches, and then let West Nile virus infection dynamics proceed in each of these patches. And afterwards, we're able to identify, well, what is the impact of having multiple different um, lots that have ivermectin-treated feeders, and does that spatial arrangement matter? For spatial arrangement, we looked at two different Lines, contiguous and random. Contiguous would be every single house with a treated feeder is one right next to each other. So we have one single treated block. Random means we have more sporadic chunks, blocks of it, which would be more indicative of homeowner choice. So between these, the reduction in infection uh, transmission dynamics were about the same between them. And we looked at infection in the mosquitoes as well as infections in the birds. For infections in the mosquitoes, I tracked the total time mis all mosquitoes were infectious for and counted up the total number of days. That's infectious mosquito days. And track the reduction in infectious mosquito days and infections in birds as we increase the number of lots in a neighborhood that have ivermectin treated feeders or x-axis. And you'll notice that both of these have very similar trends. So I'll focus on just one of them. We also notice that there's three different lines. We were uncertain exactly what is the ivermectin induced mortality in mosquitoes. So therefore we looked at two di three different levels, 25%, 50 and 100% mortality or chance that the mosquito is going to die after biting a bird that has eaten ivermectin. If we look at 100% spatial coverage, all of our neighborhood has an ivermectin treated feeder. We reduce by 36 to 84% of the infectious mosquito days. This is a huge investment and was unlikely to actually happen in the field. So if only a third of our neighborhood could have ivermectin treated feeders, we reduce by 15 to 45% reduction. So we still get a significant reduction, but it's variable debate based on the spatial coverage and the probability that our mosquitoes are dying after biting treated birds. So bringing all of our ivermectin studies together, our pilot trial and modeling enabled us to identify ivermectin as a potential West Nile virus control strategy that warrants further investigation. It has the potential for community-wide reductions in West Nile virus with large spatial coverage and high ivermectin efficacy likely to be needed for the largest reductions. Some considerations moving forward are the uncertainty in ivermectin-induced mortality in our wild mosquitoes. And as our chickens indicated, 
we need to work out what is the ivermectin dose and pharmacokinetics to be able to have a sustained ivermectin impact on our uh, mosquitoes. What is the level that they're exposed to? And these are exactly what our collaborators are still doing, future lab studies and culminating randomized field trials to develop a targeted control strategy for vector control, public health, and homeowners. So if we wrap up and sum up all of my dissertation work looking at impacts of vector control, I was providing new insights into the efficacy of existing aerial spraying and novel methods, ivermectin, that would reduce mosquito abundance in West Nile virus transmission, leading to more efficient and targeted approaches and improved prevention and control of West Nile virus. And now bringing it back to the future, I am now a postdoc acting as a bridge between NOAA and CDC with the overarching goal of improving prediction and communication of vector-borne diseases focusing on West Nile virus. And some of the major projects and goals overarching this are to identify the impact of weather data on West Nile virus predictions, starting with seasonal and subseasonal weather products. If you have expertise in this area, please contact us. Our contact info will be at the end. We would love to have more insight and leverage all of the expertise from multiple different agencies and areas. And we hope to provide large scale early warning predictions early warning predictions of West Nile virus and tools for local evaluation. And as a very brief overview of where is weather and West Nile virus prediction, I'm going to do a few, a few slides. We have, currently it's very heterogeneous and the impact of weather is not always clear in predictions. A study from 2015 identified that increasing temperature so increasing temperature anomaly resulted in increased odds of West Nile virus cases, so outbreaks, mainly in the Eastern United States with no significant impact on the Western United States. However, when we look at precipitation, we see a different trend where the Western United States increased precipitation, increased the odds of West Nile virus cases, but the opposite was true in the Eastern United States where we had a reduction in the odds of West Nile virus cases. So very heterogeneous and conflicting results between them. And then a study from 2016 highlighted that it's actually drought, temperature and precipitation anomalies together, as well as human immunity that's determining the intensity of West Nile virus epidemics and therefore the potential for how this is changing with climate impacts. So there's still work to be done to in, disentangle the impacts of weather on West Nile virus and improve predictions. So my postdoc also is aimed at improving prevention and control of West Nile virus coming through a different angle, evaluating the skills, the current skill of our prediction methods and identifying the impacts of weather on West Nile in order to enhance our prediction of West Nile virus cases, location and timing as well to guide future vector control districts and public health agencies. So thank you all so much for coming and listening. And these are the majority of my collaborators right now. I keep getting more and more and understanding more insights and leveraging more expertise from multiple different agencies. I'm currently from the Global Systems Laboratory CPO and the Division of Vector Borne Diseases at CDC. So thank you so much. Feel free to email me or anyone if you have questions. Thank you so much, Karen. Uh, that was uh, a wonderful presentation. And even the few of us who have been working with you for a few months, uh, I certainly learned a lot there in that. Uh, we do have a couple of questions that are already in the box here. Uh, and I encourage any of you who are listening, who are puzzled about uh, any aspect of Karen's presentation to add questions. Uh, Karen, here is a first question uh, from uh, a GSL colleague, Dom Heintzeller. He asked this question, do we understand the impact of ivermectin treated chicken and other animals on the food chain? Yes, um, there is some information looking at the potential levels of ivermectin in food products that are 
FDA allowable. Currently, there is no allowable level for FDA. So in future, if having backyard chickens treated with ivermectin would not be the most ideal situation because homeowners could not eat the eggs from the chickens until ivermectin had washed out completely or could not eat their chickens themselves. So it forms kind of a it's not the most ideal situation by staying at the ivermectin treated chickens. We move into more backyard birds that are not in the food chain. This provides less impacts and there's further investigation understanding is there any impact on egg laying success or the ivermectin that comes through the birds in their uh, feces? Is that impacting any soil microbes or the like to fully understand the ecosystem level impacts of this? Great, thank you very much, Karen. Uh, and one more question from uh, Randy Nett, who is also on the slide right now. Uh, Randy is up at CDC in Fort Collins. Uh, Randy asks this question, can you comment on the challenges and future work needed to better understand the relationship between vector abundance and human uh, West Nile virus infections? He also adds great presentation. I think we all <laughs> think that. <laughs> Thank you, Randy. Um, I think the largest part of being able to fully elucidate the relationship of mosquitoes and human infection is just more trapping, more mosquito surveillance, more understanding what is happening in the mosquito populations, as well as surveillance in the human populations as well. And to speed up those understanding reporting of infections in cases or doing zero surveys in populations to understand what proportion of the population actually was infected with West Nile who were more were asymptomatic or had febrile illness so were not captured. And doing all of the mosquito surveillance and human surveillance takes a lot of energy and effort and guidelines and regulations that need to be followed. So a lot of hoops and energy is needed to do that. Great, thanks very much. Uh, Karen, we don't have any other questions here right now, but I guess I will add one here. Uh, if you could go back one slide here, uh, where you are at, I, if you're able to do that. There we go. There we go, nice. So uh, in this slide here, which is pretty important, this whole idea of actually using improved uh, environmental and, and weather prediction is, is central to uh, what we're intending with this postdoc. Uh, so it kind of uses the information from your dissertation and other people in the community who've been working on that. And, and is that the right understanding of what this slide means? Yes, that improving prevention and control of West Nile virus is very interdisciplinary. We need to understand and improve our prediction as well as well when we know we have a hot spot for West Nile how do you respond to that so on the vector control side how can you prevent disease more effectively what methods can be utilized and therefore working in synergy together from prediction to control great uh Karen we do have three other questions now uh from Jenny Fox uh, out of curiosity, is there a vaccine for horses? Also, are there plans for a human vaccine uh, that would remove, uh, reduce need for spraying, et cetera? Can you comment on that? Yes, there is a vaccine for horses and it's pretty well utilized by um, horse owners due to the large um, economic costs and their manifestations when they get West Nile virus are similar to in humans where they can have very severe neurological manifestations and it's not very good and high mortality from it. On the human side, there is no West Nile virus vaccine. There's been some research into it, but my understanding is it's mainly a funding issue. It's not economically invested for the development of a West Nile virus vaccine for humans. 
but there is some work that has been dabbled into it. Very good, thank you. Uh, Evan Kalina asks this question, do we know the fraction of US adults that are immune to West Nile virus and how long might immunity last? Very good question. We do not know proportions of humans that are infected uh, or have been infected nationwide. There have been some small zero survey studies following major outbreaks to be able to identify in local areas like cities for like when West Nile virus first appeared in the United States in New York, there were some zero surveys following up from that to identify kind of the extent of the infection. But nationally, there are no mechanisms for doing major zero surveys as well. And there can only be estimations and extrapolations based on the number of neuroinvasive cases, which are likely to be captured by the health system because people are going to be going if they have neuroinvasive disease and then combining that with some information that we have from those smaller survey zero surveys as well as um, detections of West Nile through like blood donations to be able to identify well how many cases are we missing for each neuroinvasive case that we find to be able to kind of estimate and on the length of immunity I think it's I have to go back and look, but I think it's a pretty long immunity to West Nile virus. Thank you, Karen. Uh, Laura Edwards asked this question. What is the, what was the ivermectin dosage in the wild bird feeders? Um, we did not put a, for our wild birds, we did not put any ivermectin in any physical bird feeders. The bird feeders oh. I was utilizing for field studies were untreated and I was mathematically in my model applying ivermectin to the bird okay. feeders. It was like we, in the pilot study with the chickens, we were doing 200 milligrams per kilogram dosage, but the full dosage and formulation of the feed is being worked on by our collaborators at Colorado State University and a couple other agencies as well. Great. Uh Helen Amos asked this question. First of all, fantastic presentation. And she asks then the maps you showed of the east west differences in the weather anomalies and, uh, and the odds for West Nile virus uh, call to mind a map that uh, NASA Goddard, uh, I mean, Des Foley, showed this week at the Geo Health meeting on the climate impacts and migratory birds. You looked at a West Nile virus bird connection. Hmm. I think uh, the yeah. meeting here is on uh, a migration, I think. Okay. Yeah, I have not focused as much on the large scale impacts, like migration level impacts okay. of weather, yeah. but I believe I have read in some places that there are changes in migration patterns and mismatches that are happening which may be impacting mosquito or bird populations and the impacts of like drought is stressful for birds and might make them more likely to be infected with West Nile at higher levels than otherwise. But I'll have to go back and look at that map you're referencing and see if I can dig a little bit deeper. Uh, Helen sent a, uh, uh, a link here to slides Perfect. from this geo presentation, so we can look at that separately. Thank you, Helen, for that question. Uh, finally, at least right now, Kirk Holub, also from GSL, asks, uh, are there plans to conduct studies similar to your Sacramento area and other areas, uh, even on aerial spraying? Is that already taking place uh, in many places, or is that kind of unique to Sacramento? Um, there have been studies by a variety of other vector control districts across the United States trying to quantify the impact of aerial spraying and then truck mounted spraying. Those are the largest enactment of control spatially to be able to try to identify impacts. Mine was, I believe, one of the few that was taking a mathematical modeling approach and integrating a large 12 years of data to be able to identify deviations. Oftentimes it's just 
trapping before and after, like two weeks before to two weeks after comparisons to be able to identify that. But there's so many other factors like wind and temperature and season that are impacting our mosquito abundance beyond those vector control applications to be able to tease out exactly what was the change just due to the uh, vector control. Thank you, Karen. Karen, would you mind advancing now uh, as we finish up to the last slide again with our picture? There we are. So uh, we in the NOAA labs in Boulder want to uh, state our great appreciation to our NOAA colleagues, Julie Turton and Hunter Jones, who've been on this issue about environmental health connections for a long time, way before we in Boulder started to uh, indicate interest in that. So thanks so much to Hunter and Julie for that. And uh, for everyone who's been listening, uh, there's Karen's picture there. You, you didn't get to see today, but uh, Karen, thank you so much for a fantastic presentation. Uh, we learned a great deal about that and looking forward to even more excited now about our continued collaboration with you and with CDC OC folks and across parts of NOAA. So thank you again. Oh, you're welcome and thank you for this opportunity and for everyone who came to listen and learn. I'm excited to talk about my research and hopefully there'll be many more conversations in this vein. Uh, to all, we have made a, a recording of the presentation uh, and slides will be available. So we'll have that available through the GSL website uh, advertising this presentation. Thank you very much again for attending.